All right. Well, good deal, Scotty. We we are so happy to have you here. Um, I've told Tavis a lot about you, and sure. uh, I know I kind of gave a little bit of your intro a second ago. But why don't you why don't you let everybody know kind of what brought you to the DFW area? A lot of our people who are listening are in the Dallas area, uh, but I know you haven't always been here. And so if you could just kind of get us caught up on well, what brought you here, your professional background that that kind of got you to your your journey right now, where I know you're working with a lot of organizations and individuals on productivity and that sort of thing. And I know we're going to dive a lot into that, but get us caught up a little bit to what brought you all here. Yeah, thank you. And, uh, Ashton and Tavis, good, good to get to hang out with you guys. And it's an honor to be with you today. It really is. So. I've got probably that little bit of a unicorn experience and background. I really do. I don't know many people, and I'm not saying it's a good thing for sure, but a different background. So I grew up in a very entrepreneurial family. In fact, I always say my dad may be the most competitive person I've ever met in my life. He's this ultra competitive person. So I grew up in a family where my grandfather actually had a grocery store. Then he had a furniture appliance store. My dad bought it for my grandfather. So my first job was really working for my grandfather. Uh, and I, I think I started at the warehouse. I worked my way up to a delivery truck. And the biggest day was when at 15, my parents saw in me the ability to connect with people. And so I got to start selling on the retail store to adults. And man, it was nice. great. And I actually was making a really good living on, you know, after school and then on summers and stuff and loved getting to do that. I mean, it kind of, it, it was just something I was passionate about. I enjoyed helping people and stuff. And so, um, but I, I had this idea with my parents. Uh, it didn't go over real well with them. They didn't take the bait by any means about, uh, you know, we need to start selling the electronics, you know, TVs. And vi at that time, video recorders were starting to get be a pretty big deal. And they just weren't seeing the picture of that. Like, seriously, we don't want to do that. I said, well, how about if we do this? What if you let me open up a store within our store? Just give me a little bit of square footage. If, you, if I need to, I like to get rent free for a while, but eventually maybe I could pay you a little rent. Let's just see how it starts. And and so at 17, I started my my first business selling electronics and stuff. Wow. And uh, a few years later, that turned into 10 stores in three states doing nearly $5 million worth of business. This would have been the late 70s, early 80s. Wow. And, uh, and again, it was one of those things like, I, I don't know if they realized what they were committing to. I promise you, I did not realize what I was committing to because it didn't take me long to figure out. I was way, way over my head, overwhelmed, under-resourced. And I, I've, I've made, I, I made enough mistakes in that first business that I could really write multiple books, but I'm, I guess I'm too vain and proud to put it all in writing. So, uh, so that's kind of how I started my entrepreneurial background. And uh, it really, uh, through an experience of one of our largest stores burning to the ground, it was uh, really an eye-opening uh, come to Jesus meeting, really, because, you know, for Moses, God spoke to him through a burning bush. For me, it took something a little bit bigger, mm -hmm. a burning building. And through that, it really reoriented my life to say, what's really important to me? Because I saw people, the people I work with is really a means to my end to get a fancier car or a bigger house and was very materialistic in that sense. And I just didn't want to be that person and definitely didn't want to live a life that I couldn't be with my wife and my kids and that kind of stuff. And so I, I, it led me to live a life and pursue a life that had purpose and direction, but I could still be pr productive. And, um, and actually, it really led me on a journey. And, I, and I'll, I'll just pause there because there's another chapter that gets into, you know, wh what happened next. Yeah. Sure. So um, that whole chapter of your life, the electronics, the, you know, that's a part of me that I'm jealous of people who have that, that have. So one of the questions that I was going to ask you about some of the other skills, but that natural like sales ability, when you went to your parents and you said, Hey, I want to do this, those skills, obviously you hadn't read. I mean, were you into personal development at all? Had you read books? Like what about you at 15 and 17? One said, I, I think I can do this, but then just even had any sort of framework to know this is how I sell. This is how I close. This is how I hire a, someone to help me out. Like, wh What was your journey as far as personal development that we know about now back then? Well, I, I had a huge advantage. One, my grandfather was phenomenal. He was a uh, 
strong work ethic, connected well with people, but knew how to manage a business too. So he was good on the numbers, knew how to keep operations going well. And so I, I enjoyed having breakfast with my grandfather, my dad, most mornings, uh, especially during the summer. I mean, that was a normal thing. We'd get things going at the store at 7.30, we'd go have breakfast and it was just a just an ongoing, I don't think they would call it mentoring or pouring into, but we're just living life, going through experience and so forth. So I had that advantage that a lot of people gave me advantage point. Most people just wouldn't get, you know, but I got it through them and, and learned from some of their own mistakes and they, how they process and some of those things. So, but in addition to that, I've always been a learner, except when I was in school. So let me add that caveat. <laughs> you know, it, it was more of I like my own learning style and what I want to do. Read the things I want to read, study the things I want to study. I wasn't excited about algebra and not so much about English, you know. And but for things that I was passionate about and I love reading books on personal development growth. And, and at that time, we listened to a lot of cassette tapes. I can remember listening to uh, Zig Ziglar and Jim Rohn and uh I'm trying to remember another, uh, uh, his name escapes me, but a guy just, I listened to a lot as well, but it, I'll have to come back to his name in a minute. And then, so that was something I just poured in while I was reading, you know, books on leadership and Dale Carnegie's book, Think and Grow Rich was one of the first books I can remember reading that just really made an impact on me as well. So I'm not saying I was at the level I got to, but I started reading, maybe it would be a book every couple of months or so, but just learning those things. Yeah. In addition to that, my parents would invest in me to send me to different conferences and stuff. You know, those are, those are some of those opportunities. You show up at a hotel on a Saturday and you have an all day experience. Yep. Uh, they would send me to the market to represent them, to buy furniture in a market and give me say, you've got a budget of $200,000. I was doing that at 17 and 18 years old. Mm-hmm. I look back on that now. I'm like, had they just lost their mind? What were they thinking? You know? <laughs> uh, but so they, they saw something in me. I didn't necessarily see in myself early on and trusted me to do those things, knowing that I'd make some mistakes, but I would learn from those because I was a learner and I would evaluate that. How could I avoid that from happening in the future? So a combination of some good mentoring, learn from others' mistakes, make my own mistakes and have the, the safety net that I can make some and recover, but also just a desire to grow personally. Yeah. Sure. Well, and Tavis, you don't know our relationship, Scotty, but, um, you know, Tavis, what I hear you saying a lot is that baptism by fire and then having people around you that can kind of help you through that and encourage you. And that's really what happened with me on the flipping. You know, I, I had a few small flips early on, but I jumped in, just tried to figure it out. And after my second one, I really reconnected with Tavis, kind of friends of a friends on Facebook, but connected with them there. And that's when I jumped into what Tavis would call a, a level two rehab, a serious rehab over in Richardson. I was basically in over my head. And fortunately, I, I knew enough to try it out and put myself out there. But I also had people around me. And I, knew, I was also, I guess, aware enough to say I need help. And Tavis really jumped in there. So like Tavis, I know we've talked before that idea of just taking that leap. And with Scotty, it was super early on. With me, it was way after, you know, 20 years after I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, I tried my first flip. But taking that leap and sort of initiating that baptism by fire is key to a lot of like a lot of those interviews that we've done. I mean, you hear that over and over, people just kind of putting themselves out there and then figuring it out, right? Yeah, no, 100 percent. I was going to I was going to say that, you know, I mean, it, it, you know, you'd mentioned before, Scotty, you know, that your background's not really in real estate. And obviously we're the real estate heavyweight podcast, but, um, you know, a lot of it, you know, just, you you know, being entrepreneurs herself and, and even though our, you know, our platform is real estate, you know, um, the the mindset, right. Right. That you've got to have when you're independent and you're growing a business and then you're ever evolving and changing as you talked about. I mean, you threw a lot at us really quickly, right. From, the way it started for you from, you know, your baby steps, uh, within your family business. And then, you know, getting enough confidence to a point where you're like, Hey, I see, I see an opportunity here to, to expand this into the electronic world. Um, question for you is what, what do you think it was at the time? And obviously, you know, it's probably a deeper, you know, deeper story there, but what, what was the next steps that allowed you to start you know, expanding that or franchising it and and growing into multiple stores? Like what was the, 
what was the turning point for you where you said, you know, we have to expand this and, and grow outside of our, our comfort zone? Yeah. And again, in some ways I look back on that tab as this, maybe we grew too fast too <laughs> soon. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. Because I, and again, a little bit of how I'm wired, I want to always see growth happen. And so probably undercapitalize uh, under leadership as far as, because what happens, you go from you're running it and then you have to turn into an absentee manager, right? Then you have to really right. depend on others and developing and pouring to them. I was good at my, I was, I was like prolific in sales. I mean, I, sometimes I could sell that we had records of, I'd sell 27 people a, in a row without missing one. And most guys they are getting one out of three. I was just so good at that. I was really a prolific salesperson and making that translation over to how do I come prolific in developing others? I really didn't learn that skill later. I had a, a want to and a desire but it's still a lot around my own personality and stuff. So in some ways I said, hey, we're being successful here. Where are some other opportunity, opportunities that we can do that as well? So we just looked at different locations. Where could we go? This is working here. Why can't we add stores in Mississippi and Arkansas and so forth? And so we just did that. And basically we probably open up maybe, uh, I would say not two stores a year, maybe one to one and a half stores a year, something like that. But we just see the different opportunities. We'd say, hey, this market's open. They don't have a dealer doing this. Let's go in there and do those things. And we did acquire, I think, three stores as part of that. They weren't being run real well. Uh, what I realized that when I took it over, it would probably run worse. You know, I thought it would be better, but it was probably worse than what they were doing. And so we just saw the opportunity. And like I said, we started out, I think our first year, we may have done $50,000. And then within eight years, you know, we're doing close to five million. I think our best year was right at five million dollars worth of business in 10 different stores. And but the thing is, we really were not making uh, we may have been making profit via the RSA. I don't know if we had great cash flow because it seemed like we're I'm always sure. strapped and always not enough money to do what we need to do. And then you make some bad decisions along the way because you're not thinking long term. And I was definitely not a long term thinker at that. It yeah. was more of let's get it while the getting's good. Spend what you you know, don't put stuff back to build a business, take everything you can out of it and buy something else with it. So yeah. just a lot of mindset type things. I had a growth mindset to grow, but I didn't understand money. I didn't understand debt. And literally, I found myself at one place that we had two million dollars worth of debt. Now, if you can imagine this and at the time, this had been in the 80s, we were paying 20 percent interest. Yeah. <laughs> Not many businesses can make it. You at that? Just yeah. it's just almost yeah. unsustainable. Yeah, so just crazy. those lessons of debt and so, understanding the market. So what do you? I, I mean, I like I like what you said, and I think uh, you know, in our industry, there's a lot of people that do get you know a, a small taste, and that small taste you know pushes them to say, "I got to do more. I got to do more. I got to do more, and I got to grow, and I got to grow." Uh, you know, we've had a couple interviews on here with people uh, like Eric. Crutchfield that just has this burning desire to keep growing and you know and he woke up and had you know 40 you know multi-million dollar homes going at one time and um you know it's just mind-boggling right and he didn't get into it too deep as far as you know what his struggles and his challenges are while he's doing that but his next steps were to scale that back into a different dynamic right um and, and we've had those conversations with other people so what do you think that one of those a couple nuggets or big nuggets you would say would be something that you learned uh, before you expand or before you do, you know, um, grow your business further. What do you, what do you, what did you learn? What was your biggest takeaways now that you could give the audience to just explain, you know, what are some of the things that you should look at and analyze before you say, okay, now, now it's time to expand our business. I think sometimes we, we want to push the learning curve when we, it takes time to learn. We want to microwave it. And sometimes it's a crock pot that you've got to cook it with mm -hmm. and we want to make it happen fast. So I think, I think there's a lot to learn and make sure you've learned as much as you can, because if, if you don't, you're going to repeat those mistakes and it's going to, the stakes get higher. So make sure you learn all you can. And I'd say the second thing, I definitely did not get this. And that would be, if, if I were to if I were to do that same thing now, I would not look at expanding until I had enough money back in reserve that I could operate the new location for a year without having to borrow money. That I've got enough sure. cash 
And we know this cash is king when it comes to things. And I just didn't see it that way. Hey, we had a thousand dollars in the bank. Why can't we open up a new location? What is it going to take to do that kind of thing? Just no appreciation of what could come. If everything went perfect, we might get cash flow it, but ne- things don't go perfect. You have people stealing from you. You hire somebody that was not a good hire. The market changes, all those things. So learning all you can and make sure you have enough cash that you can go and 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 make it without any profit from that business in the future. So I think those things are important that I would never make those mistakes today. There's different mistakes I probably make, but not those kind of mistakes. Yeah. yeah. No, that's sure. great. Ashton, it, you've heard that a few times, haven't you? Yes. Yes. <laughs> the, uh, you know, and I made and, that mistake because I, I, for me, I was so eager to get into the real estate world. And once I figured out I could do it, I wanted to jump in and I was, I didn't have some of the basics of keeping finances, keeping records, hiring the right people. I, I was just, let's go, let's, let's figure this out. People like Eric seem to have the learning curve and it just worked. Everything went right really early on and it just kept going right. For me, I fumbled a lot. I hired the wrong people. I overcommitted on a project and then I went and got another one and I couldn't pay for this one. So I had to pause this one. It was just a mess, you know, and I, it really, it, it hurt me financially and it was really, really stressful. And I've talked about that. There's even, there's the bottom line, there's your, your P and L and all that stuff, but then there's that mental tax. There's that mental um, yeah. profit margin that you have to, that, like, you don't talk about that and making a decision that makes you stay up at night and makes you really horrible to be around with your family, there's value to that doing it one way or the other. And so, yeah, it might not be the most efficient, most progressive, most, you know, Hey, in five years, we're going to be multimillionaire decision to make, but sometimes like, Hey, let's take the foot off the gas a little bit and make sure we're doing this properly. But you don't know until you know, and you have to make those mistakes. And fortunately for me, and it sounds like for you, Scotty, and I think Tavis has had a lot of great mentors around him. When you surround yourself with people who care about you and want the best for you and who are smarter than you, and sometimes you can do that through podcasts. I know you've been a prolific reader. You've surrounded yourself with masters of productivity and business from around the world just through reading books, even just that. But when you dedicate yourself to that part of it, you can come out on the other side doing well. So it sounds like you had that transformation. That So you got to that point. The, the, the fire happened, you sort of took a, a mental step back. And so for you, what was next? What was that next chapter? You said there was a change there. So what was that change for you? Well, one of the things, and this is, this is part of my spiritual journey, but in some ways I had such a desire for material things and money. I was really raised that way. I'm not being negative about my parents because there are a lot of good things that came from that, but we we're just a very materialistic family and we measured success on your bank account, what you drove in cars and that kind of stuff. And when that burning building situation happened, and I can still remember walking through the building and a couple things happened. One, I was looking at the faces of my employees and to see their stress and anxiety, what's going to happen to them for their job. Mm. And it hit me that moment that I'd never really even thought about what their life was like. They were there for me, not the other way around. And that was, uh, in some ways, it was, it hit me in the heart. It really did. The kind of person that I'd become in that way. Uh, my heart wasn't to be that way because I saw I gave them a job and I was helping. I just, I needed to think differently about that. And the other thing, and this was almost like the death knell in some ways of I needed to change direction because for one, at one point in my life, I had this huge desire and passion to make money and <clears throat> get more, acquire more stuff. But it's almost like God took that away from me in that moment. Like I, I almost like it became almost like abhorrent to me to pursue that anymore. And it really did. And I realized therein lies a problem <laughs> when you've got a business and you don't even, you, the thought of getting it profitable again, all those things. And so I was able to sell it to my brother-in-law uh, that's done quite well with that. He still has that business some 30 something years later and turned it in a much better business and done wow. well at that. And uh, I'm not saying he inherited a very good business because it was, it was pretty crippled at that moment and it was, it was on life support, but we worked out a deal that he could get it. And uh, he's been leading that company now for 35 years since then. But for me, it really put me on a spiritual journey of what is it, God, you would have me to do? Because I, I feel like this is what I was, equipped to do. I was, and 
And I remember having conversation with, <clears throat> with my grandfather and, and mostly my grandfather. I remember like he couldn't understand it. This is what you were meant to do. We pour it into you. And I really felt a calling on my heart to do something different. And so I sold my business, put my house up for sale and just basically surrendered and said, God, what is it you'd have me to do? And through some unusual circumstances, God opened up the door for me to serve at my home church on an interim basis as the young adult uh, minister and the church administrator. I had experience in business. They needed some help there. And I just said, hey, they basically rented me for a period of time. And they did that for two years. And then they decided, you know what? Things have worked out pretty good with you. Let's go ahead and make this more of a permanent arrangement. And I ended up staying there 16 more years. Mm. And then from there, and that church grew from, you know, running about a thousand people to running nearly 4,000. It became the largest church in the state of Louisiana. We were doing national conferences, bringing in the John Maxwell's, the Andy Stanley's and a lot of top leadership type people and stuff. So it was a very unique situation. Ashton, you were a part of that as well. You got to be a part of the team at different points and stuff, but it opened up opportunities for me because we're doing national conferences where I was getting to do some consulting and stuff and really enjoyed doing some of those things. And then uh, God opened up a door for me to come into the Dallas market of the very large church as their, as their executive pastor. And I did that for less than two years. My wife became disabled, had some health issues, and I just couldn't work 60 or 70 hours a week and take good care of her. And I was doing a little consulting on the side. And I just said, you know, let me just let me just try consulting. And this was in 2008, if you recall, that was the the uh, Great Recession happened around that time. Yep. But I, I stepped out of a full time role, went into consulting. Let me figure out my wife, what's going on with her. I can always go back and be an executive pastor. And so I've been doing consulting now for uh, in April was 16 years. I've been doing that. And there were months uh, and maybe even years where I thought to myself, I don't know if I'll, I don't know if I'll need to go back and get a full time job. It was, you know, it, sometimes it was like, hey, we'll see if we can make it a little bit further and stuff. And honestly, the last probably seven or eight years, every year has gotten better than the last year. And I've been able to help more churches, more individuals than I ever thought possible. And uh, there's a lot more to that beyond just the consulting, because it's led to starting two nonprofits, starting a speaking business as well. And in some ways, it's married that entrepreneurial business background into a heart for ministry and others. It's, it's like only God could have really worked that out because I really am a unicorn in that sense because there's not many guys that uh, have had the opportunity to do that. So I feel very blessed and honored. I get to work with a lot of wonderful people and a lot of wonderful churches and organizations. Yeah, for That's sure. Awesome. And I think a couple of things of that. You know, I went to uh, my undergraduate was at Pepperdine. I went in thinking I was going to be in the ministry. I and completely butchered Old Testament, New Testament the first semester and thought, this isn't for me. And I decided to move into communications. But through the years, I worked at a nonprofit for there in West Monroe, uh, Monroe, West Monroe, and worked with uh, child abuse victims and tried to help out that system. And now I work a lot with elderly and I, I get to try to help out putting up light bulbs and things that are sort of above and beyond. And I've always felt like you know, you, you have that realization that you just sort of do what you can with what you have and you don't have to have these specific titles. And, you know, I, I know a lot of people out there sometimes think they have to have uh, this real, I don't know, they, they force themselves into these ministry positions when you could do a lot of work outside that, but that's another, maybe another discussion. So I know you've worked with at this point, thousands of people, but you've worked really closely with a lot of high level leaders and churches and other organizations. And so kind of in a, on a, I think I know your answer, but when you, let's say you got five minutes with somebody, how do you initially tell, okay, where this person's at? Is, is This is a successful, this is, this person is set up to be successful. I can tell this person has what it takes or what are a few of the attributes or things they say, or things that you can look at to say, okay, yep, this is, this is going well, or we've got a lot to work on here. Yeah, thank you for that question. And again, every person is different and wired differently. There are certain things I can usually pick up and it's maybe a wisdom discerning thing. And when you make, you know, when you make enough mistakes with people, you, you learn from that and you try not to make those same mistakes. So some of it's just been, I've been around a lot. It's kind of like the old Farmers Bureau insurance, like we know a lot uh, because we've seen a lot. So that some of that comes with the territory. I have prided myself on some organizations just hire me to hire people for them. 
because I think it's something I've, I'm pretty good at doing and I have a pretty high success rate in doing that. So I'm looking for certain traits from people. And in fact, I was having a, a kind of a mentoring coaching session with someone last Friday for breakfast and stuff. And, and I basically told him within 10 minutes of our conversation, I said, uh, let me just share with you. And I don't, I, I want you to receive this uh, in a way to help you, but I would never hire you based on what I see in you right now. And that probably took him back a little bit, but I said, I'm just being honest with you. We had a 7 a.m. meeting and you you wanted to meet with me, get on my calendar. I drove 25 minutes to meet you. You drove five minutes and you're seven minutes late. I would never hire you, just wouldn't. Mm. If it shows me a lack of respect of my time and a lack of discipline on your part. And so I just wouldn't. Now I can help you get better on that because that's something you can choose to do. There's some things I, I have no choice in the matter. Uh, I'm not going to grow more hair, most likely. I'm never going to play in the NBA, but doggone it, I can show up on time yeah. and I can be ready to take notes with people. So, so some of that is I want to see that person have certain level of respect for other people's time, see that they have discipline in their life. But I can look at a person's, what they do in their daily routine, and I can almost predict their success level right now by just looking at what they do day by day. I'm a big person in you win life by winning the day and you take one day at a time to have a plan for the day. And I believe that's the secret becoming ultra productive is having a plan for the day and you focus on the right things each day. Yeah. So, well, first of all, I will say this, Jenny, your daughter, who we're good friends with them back from West Monroe, they live over here now. That first morning that I had also requested a meeting with you at the Cracker Bell at West Monroe in West Monroe, she said, just FYI, if you're five minutes early, you're late. So if I, I got there early, I'm sure I was waiting out in the lobby, you know, looking at little trinkets and things, you know, taffy to buy or whatever. I was waiting for Scotty Sanders because I knew that if I was at all late, this was over. So we had several breakfasts there at the, uh, the Cracker Barrel. So hopefully I passed that exam, at least that part of the exam early on. So, um, you know, my question about your productivity and I know you, you, you've written a couple books and, and this is one of the hallmarks of what you train organizations on now. So when you're preparing for the day, basic question, is that something that you typically do the night before, or is that something that you get up early and plan out your day? For me, I like to begin my day doing that. Now it doesn't mean I don't give some thought the night before of what's coming. Cause I think it's good to be having that in your subconscious, but I'm more of, I want to win the day in the first few minutes of each day. And so in fact, this is, this is my plan for the day. It fits on the three by five card, but this was done at about 5.15 this morning. And so uh, I lay out you know, my plan for the day and I follow a framework or template of six different pillars that I want to incorporate into my daily routine. But I design my plan where most people operate with a default plan. Most people live by, and this is what I live by for many, many, many years, it's the no plan and the no plan. It is a plan. It's just the worst plan a person can have. And so I want to have a design plan for my day that I can know if I can just accomplish these three things today. If nothing else happens. I've already had success. But I also want to control my calendar and my schedule because everybody wants to get on my calendar schedule. And if I don't have a plan for the day, I'll crowd out the more important things to the things that are less important. So I wanna make sure I'm focusing mindset. So there are three mindsets and three motivators. I wanna have the right mindset, but I also wanna have the right motivators. So that's what I do. It takes me less than 10 minutes a day, but it took months, if not years, to develop the framework and the plan to help people to do this. So it wasn't this thing done. It took some time to get there and I've worked on it and fine tuned it, that anybody can take this. And I believe they will be more productive and still have a life and not be crazy busy. People think you, in order to be productive, you have to give up your family, you have to give up your health, and that's just not the case. And I think I'm a, an example of that. And it's not just I'm an unusual, unique person that I think you can have a plan for your day and you can do that as well. When I think Tavis, for me, is a good example, I don't know that he plans out every day. A lot, a lot of real estate, especially on the investment side, can be really reactive. You know, specifically, Tavis will get a call maybe that morning. Hey, uh, I got a house I need you to look at. It's up in the colony. We need bids in by this time or it's tomorrow. 
So you sort of drop what you're doing and go do this. So there is some of that reactive nature. I'm sure you could time block for some of those. But for me, knowing Tavis has really good boundaries. I don't have great time boundaries. For instance, this <laughs> podcast, you know, it took us a little while to find the best time to do this podcast because I, well, what about this time in the afternoon, blah, blah, blah. And he said, well, no, afternoons, I can't do that. I can't do we weekends or family time. He had a lot of these sort of natural time boundaries that he was okay with just telling me, yeah, we can't do it then. We can't, I do this this time. So I don't have a, you don't do a structured day specifically, I don't think, but you do have, you do time block and you do have specific things that you say, I don't do that on this day or this time, correct? Uh, yeah. I, I mean, I would like my, I would probably like my schedule to be a little bit more, you know, rigid and, and plan out. Like I, I, I mean, I, I envy people that get up at, you know, four or five in the morning. Um, you know, for me, sometimes it seems like, you know, and I was going to ask Scotty that with you starting your day that early, what time do you go to bed at night? Because, uh, you know, for me, it feels like, you know, if I go to bed earlier then I could definitely operate that way. But normally by the time I'm actually getting to sleep, it's, it's close to midnight every night, you know, and, yeah. and that's not always the case, but it seems like by the time we, you know, and, and my wife is, um, you know, in a, in a, very high demand, you know, job as well. And she's more of a night owl. So she gets home and by the time she gets home late and she wants to, you know, we do dinner we usually eat dinner late. And then it's like, you know, she winds down. I'm usually shut down, going to bed. She's, you know, uh, doing something to kind of her quiet time and figuring out, you know, her time to decompress. Um, you know, and, and I know that's different for everybody, you know, from that sense, but for me, it's like, you know, trying to definitely, figure out that routine to try to get up earlier. Cause it is great when you do get up early. I think, you know, you're able to do so many things like our, our friend Walter, we interviewed last week, you know, um, now I don't think he sleeps very good. And I think that's part of the problem, but you know, he's, <laughs> I think he gets up at like 4.00 AM every morning and it, most of his day is already like accomplished before 7.00 AM, you know, yeah. Yeah. um, a lot of the things that he's trying to, uh, to, to knock out on the schedule. Um, you know, but yeah, no, I, I, I think it is important. I, you know, a lot of what Scotty's saying is kind of learning, you know, those values in life and then and mixing that into, you know, what you do for a living, what you do for, you know, your passions that you have. But well, ultimately, yeah, I mean, I, years ago, I kind of blocked out the weekends to be family time and, um, you know, and, and, it's rare that if I'm actually working on the weekend, you know, but it definitely feels like when I am working on the weekend, it takes away. Right. Even if it's not anything that we truly have, like specifically on the calendar for family time, but that just seems to be, you know, that's just the blocking, right. That's just the family time that we, wow. that we dedicate for that same thing in the evenings. Most of the time um, is it that y'all decided, and I mean, and it goes without saying, but you, you decided family is super important. And I mean, even in real estate, a lot of people just assume you have to work weekends. You just have to take yeah. calls whenever. And you're a great example of not having to do that. So I guess a good question for Scotty. Scotty, just for reference, how many books have you read? Because I know, I know it's up there. But about how many books have you read? I'm really quick counting probably past a couple thousand. In fact, my, this is a library here. But my wife said, I've got to start giving more books away. So I've really moved a little bit away from physical copies. I listen to a lot of books now just because I we don't have places for them and stuff. So I've given probably a thousand books away over the years, but I'd say well over a couple thousand books. They're for probably about a 15, 20 year run. So let's say let's say if it's a 20 year run, I average reading 50 books a year. Uh, so that would have been a thousand. But I, I remember probably 10 years ago, I it was over 1500 books and but I listen to a lot of podcasts now, so I may not listen or yeah. read as many books as I used to because there are other ways to learn. So sure. I think books are still extremely important. Yeah. Uh, and I'm going to probably read 20 to 30 books a year. But maybe I mean, there was one year I think I read 75 or 80 books one year. I even took speed reading course to up my speed on reading stuff. And listen, I struggled as a young person to read. I had comprehension issues and reading I actually had to go see a speech therapist in the first, second, and third grade, and here I am now. And I and I use that a little bit to tell people you can overcome a lot in life. Don't mm -hmm. let your handicaps or disabilities hold you back at all yeah. of those things. So, again, you you know, I think I know how much work I put into writing a book, and and most people do. They put a lot of work and effort. And man, if you can read a book 
that takes you three or four or five, six hours. And you know, that person spent probably a couple thousand hours putting their work in that or their experience. Just so you lot you can gain from that. And, and my dad has said for many, many years to me, as a good reminder, he's willing to read a book if he can get one good idea from it. And typically you won't get more than that. But if you get one thing, that could change the trajectory of your life, your business, your family, and so many different things. So yeah. I think it's a worth investment time. One of my daily disciplines, I'll write down my three daily disciplines. By the way, can I put a, let me put a, let me put a pin in that. I want to go back to Tavis' thing about yeah, yeah. getting up early and stuff. I think sleep is very underrated. So I suggest people get seven to eight hours uh, regardless. Now, when I was younger, six hours would have been a lot for me because I thought I'm, a, I'm, I'm tough, I can do it and so forth. We need really seven to eight hours worth of sleep. My thing is, what how are you wired? What works best for your family? Let let that serve you best. Don't be tied to why well, I'm gonna feel like a slug if I don't if I don't go to bed early or get up early. No, you you let it serve you. You need seven to eight hours. You figure out what works best for your family. And back to your question, Tavis, I'm curious on what time you go to bed. Last night I was in bed at nine thirty. I was up this morning a little after five, you know, five fifteen. So I you know I slept right at eight hours, but I was up earlier. Sure. Typically I'm in bed between nine thirty and 9.45, other than Friday nights, I call it my late night. And I try to make it, my wife laughs at me because uh, I tell her, I'm going to try to make it to 10.30. But that's the <laughs> only day I'll give myself a little bit and I'll sleep a little bit later on, on Saturday and stuff. But that's just part of my daily routine. I think it's that routine, being consistent yeah. on that is more important than when it's, do you have a routine that works for that you? Makes and sense. Stick with yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So I, I wanted to I wanted to say this just because I think as we, you know, continue to do these podcasts and interview different people, you know, you hear a lot of consens- consistency in what people say. And, and uh, you know, what I hear Scotty say in Ashton is uh, a lot of like what Brett Caldwell was talking about, that 10,000 yep. hour journey. Yep. Right. He put the 10,000 hours in to, you know, uh, to his business and entrepreneurship and um, you know, his spiritual journey and all these things that Scotty did early on. And because he did that, you know, he can now master those skills in an interview with somebody for, you know, five to 10 minutes. Right. Um, but it's because of the time and the effort and the work that he put into it in the beginning to be where he is today. Right. And that's, that's something that we talked about. And Scotty even mentioned this, you know, it wasn't always great. You know, he went through that journey and that time and it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't always excellent, you know, but he, but he went through it and he kept doing it and he stayed consistent. And then now, you know, you form these habits uh, that just become clockwork, right. It's something that it's so, it becomes so natural after you don't it so long. And I think that's, well, it, that's just like anything. And like I said, even for me, I'll be 20 years licensed this year in real estate. I will go back. The very first broker that I worked for, um, she actually helped me in the sense of time blocking that time with your family. And she said, um, you know, she said, we don't work Sundays. She goes, we take Sunday off one day a week in real estate you know, work your schedule around that Sunday. And so it was just as easy as saying, I don't have Sunday available to show you a home, but I could be there Monday, you know, and it was just that easy. It didn't have to make it feel like anything because of course you would get pushback from people saying, you're in real estate, you don't work on the weekend. Like what in the world, you know, how can you do any business? You know, that's when people are off, you know, (laughs) and and I always had the mindset like, look, it's, it's like a schedule, you know, and you have to take it and treat it just like a, you know, like how a doctor does or an attorney does. And, and, you know, you, you basically, here's my schedule. Here's what I could do. Here's my timeline. Here's, here's what I have available. Right. And you work it around those time blocks and, you know, being back in the gym routine now, you know, that's, that's part of my time blocking as well. Right. It's like, Oh, I'm not available this time in the morning. You know, it doesn't, they don't have to know I'm going to the gym. It just, that time block is not available. Right. Yeah, for sure. So it just, it's just kind of working through that, but it is sometimes you do get, you know, you get excited because you want that business. So then you, you know, you can, um, you know, be loose in your schedule because you want to accommodate somebody else. But having those disciplines, like I said, just learning that early on being brand new, just having that Sunday off, even though 
I didn't really understand it, but that eventually turned into basically being off for the whole weekend, right? Yeah, and and just the, taking that whole weekend off to mirror my wife's schedule, right? And I think a lot of it too is one, knowing knowing your goals, knowing yourself, and being and honoring yourself and, and liking yourself enough to to stick up for yourself every once in a while and say, I don't do that, I don't I don't meet then or whatever. And so I think whenever you you are that way with your own goals and you honor your own goals and you don't give in. I think it, it does something to your soul and you know that these are, these things are important enough to me to stick by it no matter what. And it kind of drives you forward. And the, the question I asked about the books was one, I think a lot of people just talk about this structure and routine because like we talked about, you know, uh, Gladwell, the 10,000 hours you're, it's like you, you you have a plan, whether it's a good plan or not, you're, you're doing a plan. Well, you're getting 10,000 hours in whether you know it or not, you you are getting your 10,000 hours, but what yeah. is it? What are you getting your 10,000 hours in right. uh, about? And so trying to structure your day. And if you wanted to be known for something and to be, to be someone who said, well, that guy is, man, he really exemplifies X, Y, and Z. That's your 10,000 hours. And so putting those you know things into place and reading those books of, of all those little nuggets you take from things okay, this person does mornings, this person does it. But after a while, you start to see these patterns of, of structure and planning and, and that sort of thing. And so I know we're running a little short on time this morning. I really appreciate all the, the wisdom so far. I, knowing how many books you've read, I, do, I am curious. Do you have two or three that you always recommend to people that you, or you go back and, and read maybe once a year or something like that that, that people would want to know about? Probably the book that I remember that really lit my mind on just that mindset would have been Think and Grow Rich, just what you think is important. I read that when I was in my teen years, probably in my early, early 20s, a book that stuck out to me, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. In some ways, I took some of those similar concepts and put that into my book, Quest of the Keys, uh, that I put into a fantasy fiction story. They're not the same, but similar type things. Again, I tell people there's really not a lot new under the sun, right? How you present it, how you package it and so forth. And then another book that really, because when I when I went into ministry, you know, I found myself, I was a college dropout at the time, had no, no formal uh, seminary type stuff. So I went back and got my undergraduate degree in business administration. And then I got my uh, seminary degree and I got a master's in Christian education stuff. So I was on this you know, back in school, learning mode, working full time, had young kids and so forth. And in some ways, I just kind of stopped that personal development because I had to focus so much on getting the formal education that needed to do what I was doing and stuff. But I remember uh, being at a conference and and actually John Maxwell was speaking and, um, and, and he talked about one of his books, Developing the Leader Within You. And I bought that book at the conference and stuff. And that book really kind of lit my fire again, like, man, I've not really been working hard on myself about developing that leader in me. I know I've got the gift of leadership. How do I develop that and stuff? So that was a very pivotal book for me to really light that fire to say, you know, because most people, when they get whatever formal education they're getting, they're done learning. They don't learn anything after that. And then therefore, the longer they live, the more, you know, antiquated. Uh, lack of relevance they may have and stuff. And I just made that decision. That would not be me. I've got my master's degree now, but that was like the perfect timing for me to go to that conference, get that book. And I just made a commitment. I was probably would have been my early thirties at that point. And, and just said, you know what, I'm going to get on the track and I'm going to be a learner. I'm continue to learn. And, and I want to, I want to, I want to make my every year a better year for me. And that really put me on that track. So those are three books that I can look at different times in my life that I felt like, and there's just so many, it would be hard to say, but those are three that I feel like were defining books for me in some ways. Yeah. Well, we hear a lot on the podcast, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, you know, that's yep. sort of the- Read that, that one, love it too. <laughs> yeah. The definitive real estate. Hey, what's your favorite book? Rich Dad, Poor Dad. That changed my life. So many people mention that. Uh, and I know recently the hundred million dollar offer from Hormozy, that's a great book too. So right. if, if you don't, if you don't know I about read that, that one, because of your recommendation, in fact, <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. So that's more of a, a little bit more of a modern one and on marketing and, and that sort of thing. So, well, Scotty, is there anything else? I know you have, so you have few books, you train organizations, 
you offer professional speaking to groups. Um, so talk just a little bit about how people can get in touch with you, how you might be able to serve their organization if, if anyone is, is interested in learning more about um, you, your teaching and that sort of thing. So just walk us a little bit through what, what people could do to get in touch with you and work with you. Probably the best place. I'm pretty much on all the social media channels. So you can find me on Facebook and uh, LinkedIn would be another place, Instagram and so forth. But I'd suggest go to scottysanders.com. That would be my main website. And there you'll find where you can get access to tons of free training stuff. I do a weekly video. In fact, I do two videos a week now and blog articles you can do. But that would get you in my ecosystem. And I would encourage you to sign up for my masterclass called Finding the 25th Hours, a free course. It's excellent training to help you to have more margin in your life. And once you do that, you'll put your email address in there and then you'll start getting free content every week from me. So that's probably the best place to go to continue to get some training uh, from me. And so, again, I love to speak at organizations. I was just speaking in Indianapolis a couple of weeks ago and I've got uh, in fact, I'll be in Dallas speaking here pretty soon. Well, in Euless in May and July, I'm back in, uh, what, in October, I'm in uh, um, Denton. In uh, August, I'm in Plano. So I do get to speak some of the Dallas-Fort Worth area, but I speak, I'll be in Sacramento. I'll be in Denver coming up here pretty soon. So I speak in a number of places, love getting to do that. And my main talk I love to give is the secret to becoming ultra productive. Because if you talk to most people, if they're in some type of business or they're in management or something, in some iteration of this, they're going to say their biggest challenge, they feel overwhelmed. And I help people to go from overwhelmed to being ultra productive. And, and that's by creating margin. And that's what Tavis sounds like he has. He's got margin in his life and how to create margin. And you create margin in your life by having more capacity than you have load. And I help people to increase their capacity. They're capable of doing more than they ever thought while reducing their load. And oh, by the way, one of the best ways to reduce your load is to say no and to guard your calendar a little bit. So I teach people on how to do that, that they can get more done and be more productive than they ever thought possible, but still have margin in their life. I love giving that message to people and seeing it work for them because most people have been drowning for years and they just think that's the way it has to be. Yep. Yeah. Most people like me, you know, you get into another phase, you're trying to do more, you, you stay up late, you get up earlier, you just try to do more during the day and there's only so much you can do. And, and then you, you end up getting burned out and turn into Cheetos for a counselor. And I, I, I've said several times, this is, Cheetos is a bad counselor. So um, Tavis, you have any other questions for Scotty before we, we uh, are done for the day? Uh, no, it's just, you know, I, I hear these things and I, and, and Scotty, it sounds like you have kids. I'm uh, sure they're they're older now but um and you might have some grandchildren now but how do we get our kids to start thinking this way about being productive <laughs> yeah. i've got we've got a 30 year old and a and a 19 year almost 19 years old you know and of course they're you know my my 19 year old is about to graduate and um you know it's tough from a dad perspective because now it's like okay you know What's next? What are you doing? How are you being productive? What are you doing with your day? You know, mm -hmm. it's all yeah. those things. And obviously, you know, you got to think back to a little bit when we were that age and just where our mindset was. And, you know, we, we obviously didn't think of it more than what we needed to do. Right. In the sense, unless you're of, Scotty, uh, Scotty already had nine stores at this point. He's <laughs> 19. I know. Right. People, yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah, so we, we, we won't count your experience at seventeen, but the typical eighteen, nineteen year old yeah. these days, you know. What's what, what's your what's your best word of advice with that? Like how to yeah. how to how to I mean, we gotta make these these kids make it their own idea, right? You know, but and and aware of that, but how do we what's the best way to do that? <laughs> well, one of the things I've been greatly blessed with, and Ashley knows this a little bit. I, my daughter runs her own marketing company, but she's worked with me for years. My son is a VP of uh, sells for a large IT company, but I get to work with them and coach them almost every week. So I get to pour into them. They come to me. So we have that adult relationship. And some of that is modeling that for them and modeling, having good margin, having boundaries, but leading your, to me, people ask, what is the greatest leadership principle there is? And I always say it's leading yourself. Well, you start there and you model that for others. And then people say, I want what that person's got. So you always start with yourself. And one of the reasons why I wrote the book, Quest of the Keys, 
is it is really for the younger generation. It's really more for that middle school through college age group because they get into story form and they enjoy the story and, and, and collect, you know, connecting with characters and so forth. So it's a way that they can learn without thinking they're learning that much because they get into the characters, but they're learning about the importance about having a purpose in life and how to prioritize and how to plan. So that's another, you can go to questofthekeys.org. Uh, it's on the scottysanders.com website, but you can order it on Amazon. It's a, I got an audible version of it and also a, a soft copy a book that you can get and an ebook as well. But it's a, I'm not saying every 30 year old would probably want to read it, but if they enjoy story, almost like a fable type thing, if you think about it, and what really gave me this idea, I read Og Mandino's book years ago, The Greatest Salesman. I don't know if you're familiar with that book or not, but it's really, that's what it is. You learn these principles through a story. So I kind of, I really, you know, stole that idea from Og Mandino and put that into leadership, character development stuff into a story form that's done quite well. So that that would be something you could, uh, you know, give them as a gift, let them read it, and, and maybe you can ask them some questions about it. That's awesome. Cool. Thank you. Well, Scotty, thank you so much for your time and, and the wisdom. You, I've had a lot of breakfast with you. Your breakfast is, is sort of your mentorship time. So at some point, Tavis and I will... I don't even know. I think the closest Cracker Barrel is over on the other side of town. I haven't. I don't know that I've eaten at a Cracker Barrel since you and I had breakfast in West Monroe a few times. But we'll, we'll make have, it happen anytime. We may, yeah, we may have to update our place, but maybe we can do a, a breakfast mentorship uh, meeting. That would be really, really awesome. So thank you so much for your time, Scotty. And if anyone wants to get in touch with him, we'll definitely link his information in the show notes, and we'll be putting this out on social. Uh, until next time, definitely like, subscribe, like. share this podcast with a friend. Uh, we're bringing you information like this, interviews with real estate professionals and, and people that are in the DFW area who are just high level people like Walter that we had last week that is in the marketing world. And we've we've interviewed some of the top notch real estate professionals in Dallas and even uh, in, and down in Austin, Dustin down in Austin. So. We've seen a lot of people come through here. You start to hear a lot of the similar things. So go back and listen to some of those interviews. I think you'll get some nuggets from those as well. But until next time, we hope you have a great day.